two main things that come up when we're trying to get to know somebody and who knows, maybe form a life with them is our communication style. And I think that's highly informed by our attachment style. And that is informed by how the people who raised us did so. So I think exploring all of that is really important because inevitably I feel, again, attachment style and communication styles are going to be prompted when attempting to date somebody. We're going to be talking today with two therapists, Dr. Nazanin Moali and Richard Espinoza, and we'll be discussing the psychological impact of dating apps. Hi, everybody. I'm Sandy Wiener. Welcome back to Last First Date Radio, where we believe it is never too late to go on your last first date and to support you on your journey to lasting love. I've written two books. The first is Becoming a Woman of Value, How to Thrive in Life and Love. Most of us are just surviving. And if you want to thrive and develop your core confidence, this is the book for you. The second book is called Choice Points in Dating. And this is your guidebook to all the choices that you have in dating. I got tired of hearing people say, I have no choice. And no matter where you come from or what your background or your history is, you have so many choices from how to think about dating to how to create your must-have and deal-breaker lists and how to know when to stay, when to go, and how to do online dating, offline dating. Everything is in this book. They're both available on Amazon for Kindle or paperback, and the Choice Points book is now available as an audiobook. This week's tip on becoming a woman of value is learn to receive graciously. We're so good at giving, but receiving is so difficult for us for some reason. And so my challenge to you today is to learn how to receive, just to say thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you for offering me some help. Thank you for offering to pick me up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I receive that. Okay, and before I bring on our guests, I want to invite you to join Your Last First Date. It is my Facebook group. It's for women over 40 who are either single or in a relationship, and it's a place for positive support, which is a rare thing to find out there in in groups, whether on Facebook or anywhere else. It is a highly monitored group, and you will feel safe and sane on your journey to lasting love. So join us at your last first date. And now for my guests, Dr. Richard Espinoza and Dr. Nazanin. Moali have always shared the fantasy of playing matchmaker. As clinical psychologists specializing in sexuality and relationships, they have the skills to quickly understand how people think, feel, and relate to others through talk therapy and psychological assessment. Given how well they know love languages and personalities, they often fantasized about their clients meeting and connecting, and that's how they created LA Love Lab. It offers quality masterclasses and unique speed dating events designed to spark your best match. Welcome to the podcast, Richard and Nazanin. Thank you for for having us. us. (laughs) You're welcome. Um, So let's talk about dating apps, the (laughs) dun-dun-dun. So many people hate them today. Uh, There's been a a big, uh, just a lot of failure of people getting just exhausted from dating apps. They feel dating apps are just falling short in so many ways. And you guys mentioned the paradox of choice, um, which I like to talk about. My my book is actually called Choice Points in Dating. And the first chapter talks about the paradox of choice. And what does that have to do with dating apps, in your opinion? What I see often with my client is that people are kind of having this idea there's just too many options out there, which kind of lead them to have this thinking of, okay, if this doesn't work out, there's always going to be a next one. Or this idea we can be super picky about things in reality. It's not as important. For example, if we're thinking about the relationship that works, it's not not always 100% match. But now we have this idea that what if there's someone out there that's gonna be a hundred percent match. So I'm not gonna invest in this relationship in this person right now because I have plenty of options out there. So we can get uh, fixated on minor 
imperfection. And uh, that can cause an issue. Maybe we're not giving a chance to someone that might be a good fit if we meet them in person. The other issue with having this idea of there are so many people out there, this uh, kind of uh, challenge that we're talking about is that we're not really investing in these conversations. If we're thinking about this person I'm talking, this is someone that could be a match. We might be more invested in this. But now, because we're thinking there are too many people out there, maybe we're not showing the best version of ourselves or, or we're not making it, uh, enough effort. Those are really important things because back in the day, and I'm before dating apps, I used to date people back in my hometown of Baltimore and you would date whoever was there until you didn't date them anymore. That was pretty much it. It was like you tried it out and then you moved on, but you weren't like three minutes in and then, oh, well, there's somebody else. But I remember when I moved to New York City and I was in my mid twenties and I would hang out outside of my synagogue on Saturdays after services. And there were so many singles there that I always felt like people were looking over my head at the next person. So even without dating apps, I do remember that paradox of choice and I hated it. It was like, oh, well, somebody who's blonder or darker or, you know, shorter, taller. And those things are so superficial. So we, we really have been messed up by this paradox of so much choice that we don't settle on trying to get to know the person in front of us. I agree with what was said beforehand. I think it's, in my opinion, a byproduct of consumerism. If we walk into a store right now with the intention of buying salt, we have so many options of just salt, things like that. And I feel that dating has been become a commodity now. And these, if these corporations are aware of that. And so now with the intention of finding love and companionship and meaningful connections, we have so many options. Now, if you're looking for one date, well, you have the option, just for example, if you're in like a metropolitan area, for example, to chat with a hundred people in the span of 10 minutes. And so, yes, I, I agree with what Dr. M said that it, it allows us to, to fragment what we're looking for. We fragment the people we allow into our circle, and we also fragment ourselves, giving just portions, pieces of ourselves. When we're trying to make an authentic, full connection, it doesn't really translate when we're only giving fragments of ourselves for this. It's a good way to put it, fragmenting people and fragmenting ourselves. I, I hadn't looked at it like that, but I think it's so true, and it's become so superficial. Connection in general has become a real problem because we rely on text and we don't look up from our phones. And, you know, just in general, I think we have a real issue of communication and attention, you know, giving people attention and, and really listening and connecting. Let's talk about another aspect of online dating, which is ghosting. Um, people will be in the middle of a conversation. I just saw a funny clip on Instagram where a guy was demonstrating online dating and he was talking to himself, you know, as, as his date. And he's like, hi, how are you? Um, where are you from? And the person goes, Ohio. And he goes, oh, great. I used to live in Ohio. What town are you from? And then there's nothing on the other end. It's like, oh, are we done here? It, it, that's the way it goes so many times. So that's just at the beginning of a conversation. But then there are times when you are on a date. You know, you've already had a date. Um, you're leading up to a date and the person doesn't show up. And it's a horrible feeling. So give us some of the, um, the psychological reasons why this is so, so difficult for people, even though it's just so prevalent, it still just hurts so much. So give us some of that background psychology. Well, it can be very, it's such a painful experience because it can trigger all of our insecurities around, am I good enough? Did I say something? Is it something about me that the person got scared? So it can bring all of our childhood wound front and center in a way. And, uh, Unfortunately, sometimes when we're talking to people, whether in social media or in dating apps, 
when, because we don't see them. Sometimes people don't show uh, the same respect that you would extend to someone that you would meet in person. We say cruel things or we think we can just disappear. When it comes to ghosting, it can be damaging for the person who kind of like, as you notice, notice that they're talking to themselves out of the blue. So the person who goes, oftentimes they see few patterns. Uh, number one is like avoidance of conflict, right? We haven't learned to communicate when we're not interested in, 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 in something anymore. Maybe in our family of origin, uh, when we were talking about something that we didn't want, then the parents would kind of like shame us. They, they showed lots of anger. So now we're scared to have this authentic communication. So I think that is that could be part of it. The other part, unfortunately, is lack of investment. Going back to what we're talking about, we're thinking about there's just so many different options out there. I got busy. I didn't get back to the person. Oh, well, I, I let, let me go to the next person. But we're not fully invested. Or maybe we met someone, we felt, we felt something else came up. Right. And we're thinking about, oh, this person is more interesting. So let me just pivot the conversation. The other part that can be very interesting and painful at times, sometimes people use it as a way of exerting control, kind of feeling that something happened during this, uh, this interaction. I feel shamed. I feel small. Maybe you brought up an opinion that was different than mine. And I'm going to ghost you in a way to show you that I have control over you, which, you know, of course, none of these things are uh, helpful. And I guess the only time that ghosting can be uh, effective and helpful for people, because they have sometimes clients that they feel unsafe. If you feel unsafe in a communication, then you have the right to disappear. You don't mm -hmm. owe it to communicate with someone that makes you feel unsafe or ab you're abusive. Richard, what's, what's on your mind? I, I wholeheartedly agree with what you said about safety moments ago. It's sometimes the best we can do is feel safe enough when we get a clean break, when that feels like the only option we have some from, from somebody. Um, unfortunately, with the clients I work with, I've heard that the few times where ghosting seemed the most appropriate was when they felt like their opinion was going to be either rejected, um, not received, or straight up um, challenged, told that they're wrong. So for example, I had a client that wanted to dissolve a relationship. It was short term with someone that they were seeing briefly. But when I was talking to them and exploring their communication styles, and we were talking about strategies on how to dissolve things peacefully and amicably, their first response was, well, the other party isn't going to take that. And when I would ask a little bit more, it sounds like this client had the understanding that the other party just wasn't going to take no for an answer, wasn't going to explain it. And in the past, when they have tried to bring this up, they were told that their opinion, their experience is wrong, that you know, you're not letting this work because of X, Y, and Z. So there are a few times where, yes, ghosting actually is the safest option for someone. Yeah, I, I don't know that I would call that ghosting. I'm, I'm not sure, because I, I think that it's more about setting a boundary for me. It's like it's like when when to stay silent in conversation. There are times in communication when saying nothing is better than saying something. I, I think, you know, I understand where you're coming from, but I think that ghosting is, to me, where... It, somebody was in the middle of conversation or dating somebody and then just disappeared without a word. And it, it happens sometimes even after months of dating where like Nazanin said that people don't know how to bring up hard things. They don't know how to have difficult conversations because of childhood wounding. And um, often, you know, they just feel like if, if it's too hard, I'm not going to say anything. In any case, it's it's really painful. Um, and I, I do agree with you, though, that there are times when saying nothing is the best choice. And there are people who can be abusive. I used to answer everybody when I was online. I would I would explain and school them, <laughs> which was, I would never do today. But I would be like, you know, you shouldn't act this way or you're you're not single long enough to be dating. And then people would get really abusive with me. I would never 
recommend doing that. I would never do it again. But I remember one time when I was more religious and I told the guy that we were not aligned religiously after we had a phone call and we never met. And he sent such a nasty response to me about religious people feeling like they're better than other people. And who do I think I am? And yeah, so in that case, nothing said would have been a lot better. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I just think we, we, there's a lack of respect in general. You know, I think this is kind of what we're talking about is whether it's ghosting or, you know, having so much choice that we're just choosing and choosing and choosing. We're not really respecting people. Would you not agree? <laughs> how we respect people, how we think it's okay to interact with people definitely comes up in these scenarios. I think the notion of ghosting or really just dating itself, it really highlights and underscores how we've already thought it was okay to attach to people and communicate. So I feel the two main things that come up when we're trying to get to know somebody and who knows, maybe form a life with them is our communication style. And I think that's highly informed by our attachment style. And that is informed by how the people who raised us did so. So I think exploring all of that is really important because inevitably I feel, again, attachment style and communication styles are going to be prompted when attempting to date somebody. Yeah, for sure. Can you talk a little more about attachment styles? And we've done many shows on attachment, but if you can just kind of briefly explain it for anyone who doesn't know. Yeah, absolutely. So it started with John Bowlby in the 1960s. Uh, he was in England, if I'm correct. And he was working with, to be frank, abandoned and abused children day in and day out. And so he started noticing patterns on how based off how they were raised, the, the young ones were raised and treated, how that led to them forming attachments with other people uh, late in later years, including adulthood and including romantic relationships. And through his study and research and observations, he determined that there's about three to four styles of attaching to, to others that we develop. Again, based off how early um, attachments or relationships with caregivers framed us. And that framework is secure, which is about 40% of, yeah, about 40% of the global population. Then the other 60%, or excuse me, 60% is the secure attachment, meaning that they understand that people will enter and leave my life throughout my time in the lifespan. The other 40% is insecure attachment style. And that is split between 18% being avoidant attachment style, 22% being anxious attachment style. So the quick nutshell explanation of those two, anxious is if I cling to someone and attach as quickly as possible, then I can guarantee and ensure that they'll never leave me. The opposite, avoidant, if I never get too close to somebody, well, then how could they ever hurt me if I've never really let them in? So that's my quickest explanation of attachment <laughs> styles and where it came from. Yeah, thank you. That was a, that was a good cliff notes for anybody listening. And, um, and so understanding yourself and your attachment style and your communication style is really important. And, you know, I encourage clients to talk about their communication style early on because people have different styles. Like a client of mine was dating somebody who never texted and she would send a text and he just wouldn't respond. And it was making her crazy. And so it's important to have a, a, a conversation about that because if you're an anxiously attached person and you're waiting for a response, your nervous system can go wild waiting and making up stories about how this person probably found somebody else and oh my god and they don't care about me and they don't love me and blah, blah, blah. and you know when in reality this person is not a texter and so does that work for you too like you know are you okay with that are they communicating in other ways are they showing you that they care about you in ways that really feel solid so what would you suggest if people have different communication styles? Reflect on a previous relationship. First of all, what worked and what didn't work? Because sometimes we think that 
we know about our patterns, but we, we don't know. So it's important to zoom out in a way uh, to examine. So kind of thinking about, is this my primary style or not? And I love what you mentioned, kind of like naming it, saying that this is the modality, this is how I communicate. Does that usually work for you? What is the best way of communicating with you? And at times, kind of like naming it, I know it can be very vulnerable. Like if, as you said, asking the person, like, you know, it's really important for me to be able to feel hurt in a communication. And when this happened, when I send a text and I haven't heard respond, I felt a little bit uncomfortable or I felt uh, unseen, something in that effect. So the person A can see that uh, you're good at, with communication, B, owning your part, and C is that talking to them, kind of creating this expectation. When I'm contacting you, I, I'm expecting a communication. I think that's important. The other part is to have compassion for ourselves. Something that at times I notice is when we're dating, we are almost zooming in all of our behaviors, right? Now thinking about, am I doing this right? Maybe I should have not sent the text. So you're, I think what's important of thinking about in the moment with the information you had then, you did your best. And you, it's important to have your own back. But Sandy, as you mentioned, it's important to have this conversation and name it early on in their communication. Yeah, and I like the way that you gave us some language for it, because I think it is such a vulnerable thing to bring up. And so many people just would rather not say anything than to actually bring it up. And I had I had dated a guy briefly who was a terrible texter. And um, and I brought it up right away, like on date two. I said, um, I noticed that you don't respond to texts and I'm trying to get to know you and understand your communication style. I've never dated anybody who took that long to respond to a text. So tell me more. Is this something you do with everyone? Do you not like texting? Tell me more. And then I shared, you know, what my needs were. And he said he would try and meet them and he never did. And it was not a good relationship, but it was good to get it out early on so that he understood this is something I need and here's why. And let me understand you. And, you know, his excuse was I don't respond to anybody. And in fact, I had a friend who wanted to take me to a concert and I, took a month to get back to him and the concert was over. Like, okay, that doesn't work for me. I would be really pissed off at you if I was your friend. Um, but yeah, what about you, Richard? What do you have to add to that? Adding to that, I have a follow-up experience that I had with a client as well. Um, they were in a similar situation. And what I reminded this individual was that uh, this is going to prompt two dialogues. First, the dialogue with the self, which I as their therapist was helping them just really understand and check in with themselves. How do I actually communicate? What has actually worked for me in the past? What channels of communication have I valued more than others? And what have I interpreted and maybe misinterpreted from past communications? And then two, the second dialogue that this facilitates is a dialogue with the person you're trying to get to know. And so I agree with simply just bringing up uh, past experiences that hopefully you've explored with a professional or such, and then bringing that up with the parties going forward. Because with the example I'm about to share, uh, a client did all of this, had the dialogue with the self facilitated by me as his therapist, and then had the dialogue with the person they were trying to date. All in all, it was a similar situation where the other party was just a bad texter. And at the end, we realized that what the other party viewed as being a bad texter was simply someone who just didn't value texting and the written word as a main form of communication. This person, the other party, preferred just phone conversations. So having that conversation helped clear up their channels of communication that, okay, if you want to speak with me and want that quicker, uh, instantly gratifying experience of just chatting with me and getting to know me and hearing my voice, just pick up the phone. And so what could have been a barrier of just being a bad texter was further explored and turns out, okay, maybe that's just one channel of communication they don't value as much, but the two of you can still find a channel of communication that you do both value. Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Amazon Music Unlimited. 
You can listen to over 70 million songs and thousands of playlists and stations. Plus, you can now stream your favorite podcasts like Last First Date Radio. You can listen to any song, anytime, anywhere, on any of your devices. Get Amazon Music Unlimited for free for 30 days. Just head on over to getamazonmusic.com forward slash last first date to learn more and claim this offer. I try to get off dating apps as soon as possible because there's so much lost in translation in text. And I invite people to a phone call because I want to hear somebody's voice. And that doesn't mean I'm going to stay on phone calls forever, but it shows that I value communication. And I had a client who was very anxiously attached and she had a boyfriend who was pretty securely attached. And he would say, I'll call you tonight. And then he'd fall asleep because he overcommitted. That was one of his issues is he was a people pleaser and would say, uh, you know, I'll, I'll definitely call you. And he he would do this pretty regularly and she would wait for his phone call. And in the beginning of their relationship, she was afraid to bring it up. And then she, because we worked together, I helped her to, to have a conversation both with herself and then with him about what happens to her nervous system when he says he's going to call and he doesn't call and what the stories she makes up and how important it is for her to know, like, what to do in those situations. And he said, you can call me, you can wake me up. I never do it on purpose. I'm really sorry. And he worked on not over committing, um, you know, and so they had, they got a lot closer because they had that conversation. And I think instead of staying in your head and making up stories, it is so important to have these conversations. We live in a society that shame people for having needs. Right. I oh, think yeah. what we all have needs, that's so important to name it. As a sex therapist, I tell people when you share your needs outside the bedroom with someone, uh, whether they attend it or not, it can show you information how uh, generous and loving they are and how much of a great communication are in the bedroom. So I think these are very important uh, clues that people need to kind of pay attention to. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up needs because so many people confuse needs with neediness and are so afraid to be vulnerable and needy and be seen as weak, you know, by bringing up needs. And I believe we should all know what our standards are, what our needs are, and what our feelings are. And so many of us can't name any of those things. And once we know, then it's not needy. It's, it's actually just letting people get to know you and you get to know them. And you see if you're aligned and if you can negotiate differences. But without having these conversations and, and owning the fact that our needs are a really important part of who we are, we walk around with unmet needs, then we become needy. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of neediness, let's talk about anxiety for a minute. <laughs> um, a lot of times people on dating apps are feeling a lot of anxiety when they finally get on that first date and they meet in person. So can you talk to that a little bit about the anxiety and how people might be able to work on that? What did I invite people to do is to focus on their why. Why am I doing this? Because let's be honest, it's uncomfortable to go on first dates. Most people feel that like I have such a busy life. Most people, it's kind of uncomfortable to go and push themselves to meet the person in, in person, the stranger, especially if they had all this negative experiences with ghosting, people being cruel or harsh, all of that. So it's normal to have the anxiety, thinking about why am I pushing myself to do it? Am I looking for a family? Am I looking for a companion? What are my core values and why am I sitting with this discomfort? Because what people think at times is that I, if I can only get rid of this emotion, if I can get rid of my anxiety, sadness, we cannot necessarily get rid of them we can manage them, but also we can take action because our why is important. As far as a quick tip that's really important after kind of honing in the why, I encourage the people to do some grounding right before going on a date. What's really important is to make sure you're regulating your nervous system. That could be like doing a breathing exercise. 
It could be like doing journaling that can be very important. Uh, also, I tell people at times that that can be really helpful if you are doing something that you like right before. So you are in your element. I have male clients, they go boxing before going on a date. I have female clients, they would do dancing. So you want to make sure that you are uh, kind of like uh, focusing to do your best to move your body before so you process the anxiety. We don't want to necessarily manage it with drinking or necessarily distracting because if we're using those strategies, those might get in the way of us showing our as best version of ourselves. Very true. And knowing your why is so essential with anything we do in life. It helps us to understand ourselves and our motivation and our core values, like you said. Great tips too. What about you, Richard? I think continuing with the theme of the why, it's also understanding the what of what anxiety is, which from a clinical perspective, it is excessive negative thoughts and frequent worried thoughts that one can't control thinking about future events. So I always remind clients that their brain is very powerful. And once we claim ownership of our mind, we can have it do really powerful things in our favor for us. And so I agree with grounding techniques, breathing exercises, but from a reality therapy standpoint, I say just honor that, honor your experience. I typically come from the stance, again, from checking in with oneself beforehand and having that personal one-on-one -on -one dialogue. And so asking yourself, checking in with these experiences. So what is my central nervous telling me? If my palms are a bit sweaty, I'm feeling my breathing, my chest is a bit tight, uh, maybe I'm having, you know, my heart is pounding, I'm having palpitations, honoring that, saying, you know what, maybe I'm excited to potentially get to know somebody who I may spend the rest of my life with. The other end of that is, what is my central nervous telling me? Oh, I'm nervous. I'm about to be interviewed by somebody. I'm also at the same time about to interview them. And I'm, I'm applying for the position of a life partner. So I feel once we have that internal dialogue with ourselves, check in with the physiological sensations that our brain and spinal cord is trying to tell us, we can then shift it towards the positive of, I'm excited. I'm about to meet somebody. So anxiety is two sides of a coin on one side, it's nervousness, but on the other side, we could think of it as excitement. Yeah. We've, I've heard the term nerve sided <laughs> a little bit of each. Uh, and it's, it's so important to check in with your body, you know, and again, this is some, an area that people neglect, don't tune into, and we don't even feel that our fists are clenched, that we're sweaty, that there's stuff going on in our bodies because our body holds so much wisdom and if we can tune in, we can really start to ground ourselves. Um, those are great tips. And I, I like to use the Byron Katie method of questioning, is it true? Um, when people spiral out and make up stories. And so a lot of people who have a lot of anxiety will make up a story that, you know, I'm going to be interviewed or it's going to be another horrible date. And and so asking yourself, is this really true? Do we know without a doubt that this is true? And who do I become when I believe it's true? Oh, I become an emotional wreck. And then who, who would I be without that thought? And so helping people to kind of cycle through that is, is really helpful and grounding as well. So let's talk about another beautiful topic, rejection. <laughs> um, rejection, I mean, I define rejection as... as something a little different than most people, I think, because people can't really reject us unless they know us, but I think we feel rejected on dating apps a lot. Um, I think if we can see it a little, reframe it a little bit, we can, we can handle rejection differently, but I'm curious what the psychological effects are of people believing they're rejected over and over and how can people become more resilient and work through this? Well, Sanya, when you were talking about this, I got reminded of this wonderful client I had. She was always saying, it's not rejection, it's protection. Mm -hmm. uh, because she was saying that if the person is not a match, then why would I waste my time and resources? So that's, that's a good way of looking at it. But as far as its psychological impact, it can lead to dating fatigue. 
kind of feeling that uh, like I'm putting all of my emotional uh, help, time, investing in this, and here it comes another opportunity, another person that I'm not interested in them, they're not interested, or perhaps uh, this is not something that they kind of like, they kind of reject me in a way that's not kind and thoughtful. So people lose uh, hope and they lose their excitement. So that's part of a dating fatigue is really real. The other thing is increasing our pessimism, right? Kind of thinking about that, that there's no, there's not a match for me out there or there's something wrong with me. Why do I try? So uh, as, as you were mentioning, we were kind of like internalizing this experience as to much of what you were talking about, that this particular person wasn't a fit for me. We're turning it to the story of kind of I'm, there's not a person for me out there. And that can be dangerous because maybe then tomorrow you meet someone at an event or outside, or as you mentioned, outside like your uh, church, synagogue, all the places. And because you have this negative outlook, then you will now be open to seeing them. And I think that's really important. And that can also trigger our other vulnerabilities. Perhaps at times people have this, to so talk about wounds from their past, this kind of like, abandonment issues that was something that was related to the kind of childhood as Richard was talking about, and that can get triggered. As far as what we can do to build resiliency, I always tell my client, make sure you're creating a balanced life. It's not, I, I know that you wanna meet someone, it's really important for you, but make sure you're carving out time for friends, hobbies, self-care. So uh, to me, for majority of my clients, what I'm hearing is like taking out money from their emotional bank when they go on the first dates or they do back and forth on online dating. So you wanna make sure you're depositing with doing self-care and grounding exercises, doing therapy, all of those great things. And the other part is kind of looking at rejection, as you mentioned, in a different lens. For many people, they look at it as a learning opportunity of uh, how, how can I fine tune my interpersonal skills? How can I communicate better? Uh, at times my clients say that I use it as a way to practice the skills that I'm working on, right? It can be a mini lab of if you're working to be more assertive, to kind of like have this practice with someone that the stakes are not high. Uh, I think these are the few things that come to my mind. Richard, what, what comes up for you? Yes, I, again, drawing from a reality therapy standpoint, is the acceptance that the fear of rejection, it's a fundamental part of the human experience. And it's deeply tied to our nature as simply social beings. We are social creatures. So yes, it's advantageous for us to connect with people and form lives with them. And so that's why it hurts us psychologically so bad when we lose or feel like we've closed the opportunity to connect with somebody else. So I agree with the stance of reframing one's thoughts. Again, the human mind is incredibly powerful. So once we become friends with our mind and learn where we got all of our habits from, it's much easier to then shift them towards the positive. So I agree that accepting and understanding missed opportunities and rejection as a learning experience, I think it can be incredibly empowering. And once a person sits more within their power through the different dimensions of themselves, then that helps in, in effect, develop one's self-confidence and developing one's self-confidence. That's very obvious because we're social creatures to other people around us. So I think that shift in perspective helps us develop more solid sense of self, i.e. self-confidence. And that looks much more attractive to the world. Yeah. That's really, both of those are really important. And I, I think something else comes up that I wanted to address, which is that people can sort of dismiss the rejection as, well, you know, okay, not no big deal, you know, I'm going to move on, but then they become sort of hardened. Um, they're moving on, but there's sort of like, and hey, nobody's going to be there. So it's sort of a combination between what you said, Nazanin, about kind of losing hope but they're just, they just sort of build a life that doesn't include dating anymore, you know? And I think I see it a lot in the older demographic that I generally deal with. Uh, people have just been through so much and they're just like, I'm going to build this wonderful life and I don't need a person to complete me, so to speak. 
Um, what what advice do you have for people who are sort of in between? They're not they're not hardened completely, but they, they and they do have a full life, but they have been rejected so many times or so kind of done with it. You know, what do you say to that? One thing at times I tell my client is that kind of imagine that like it's an exercise we have from acceptance and commitment therapy. Imagine it's your 80th birthday. What what do you want to be? Who what how do you want to be there? What do they what do you want them to say? Right? Do you see a part there or not? What do they what do you want them to say about you? So kind of having that image kind of helping you to have that why is really important. The other thing is uh, kind of thinking about, okay, so you deserve love and affection and all the wonderful things. Maybe if you have had these experiences, for example, like you've done online dating and didn't learn to what you wanted, maybe that platform is not yours. It's not like you're broken. Maybe you need to switch to something else or maybe you've tried everything else. Maybe you need to see a professional to help you to fine tune what's happening there. Because sometimes we are repeating the patterns from our past and we don't have awareness around it. It happens to all of us. So sometimes working with a professional can help us. What is happening there? Uh, my hope for people is not necessarily losing hope, focusing on, but also focusing on what do I need to adjust to have the experiences and the love that I deserve. What, what do you, what's in your mind? Yeah, I, to add to that, I, if a person feels like they're very plagued by these pessimistic thoughts or these feelings of hopelessness or what's the point, I, again, taking a reality therapy stance, I say lean into it. Let's track this. Let's even quantify it. So if your brain is going to, some people feel betray you with these excessive negative thoughts, these worried thoughts. Okay, well, let's actually invite, let's start the reframing now by let's invite these thoughts and let's actually track them. So I encourage my clients, whenever they're feeling a certain subjective state of being, some state of mind, ask themselves, is this on a scale of zero to 10? It likely is somewhere. On one end of the scale, we have zero, that's complete pessimism. I have no hope for the future. I'm gonna die alone, it's never gonna work out. 10, we have optimism. You know what? I'm having learning experiences. Yes, I've faced rejection, but it's teaching me the right type of people to invest myself into and the wrong type of people I should save myself from. And when a person is feeling an intense emotion, check in with themselves. Where am I right now on that scale of zero to 10? Am I down in the dumps at zero or am I, you know, truly hopeful that my life is going to be okay? And I feel on the scale closer to 10, that could be something to, to just uh, springboard off of something Sandy mentioned earlier, be comfortably single in the time when one is not partnered. Like there's a moment where often I hear with my clients where they get to a place of developing that internal dialogue with the self where they feel truly comfortable not being partnered. It's not that they're avoid it of partnership, um, they've actually come full circle. They're actually really comfortable within the self and that they know that another person entering their life simply complements their life, doesn't necessarily complete them, so to speak. So I feel just constantly checking in with yourself, asking yourself, where am I on this scale from zero to 10, pessimistic to optimistic, and maybe writing that down or logging it, maybe on a daily basis, that helps us kind of snap out of it. That helps us realize that I'm ultimately in control of my experience. And therefore I'm ultimately in control on who I connect with and form attachments with going forward. But again, I think it just starts from that basis of reality of, you know what, that's part of the human experience. I'm feeling a bit disillusioned and that's okay. I think honoring that from the first start is what's helpful in developing that to a sense of being comfortably single if they're not partnered and accepting where they are on their daily different scale from pessimism to optimism. Mm. There's a lot of compassion and empowerment in those statements. You know, I think a lot of people try to run away from emotions that feel negative to them and think they're bad, you know, th those are bad things to think. And I think if we move towards them and we start to really understand ourselves better, we have, a, we have better lives. I mean, it's not just about dating and relationships, it's relationships with ourselves and with everyone around us. 
And so both of you have spoken to um, just being kinder to ourselves and to others. I mean, I think that's really key. And um, that brings me to my final question, which is what are your final words of advice for anyone who wants to go on their last first date? Stop questioning your worth. You're worthy, you're, you deserve to have love. If that's something that's like, it hasn't worked for you, is to kind of identify the pattern and adjust those patterns. If you can do it on your own, do that. If not, work with a professional. The other part of it that's that's important for people to kind of like think about what do I bring in a relationship? Because sometimes we are kind of so focused on uh, having these check marks in mind, but kind of thinking about what can I add to someone's uh, life and that can help us to feel uh, more grounded and showing up with more confidence. The other thing is that practice being your authentic self and communicate your needs clearly. As we talked about, sometimes we play small, uh, small and shrink ourselves and we're not saying what's important for us. But if you are sharing what's important for you early on, you will be able to uh, more quicker, go quicker looking through kind of like the list of people that you're dating. And maybe that can help you with eliminate people sooner. So that's, that are some of the things that's, that shows up for me. And Richard? And I think it continues with the theme we've both been exploring on self-compassion and self-love. Um, taking, drawing from the Alcoholics Anonymous saying of, if you can't love yourself, how can you love another? I think, as I've been saying, it begins with that first internal dialogue with the self. So that self-compassion of, okay, I may be feeling lonely, but you know what? That's just a result of social pain I'm feeling from not developing relationships where I'd like them to be right now. And so it's about being nice to oneself. If you're nice to yourself, then that's going to show. And then other people are going to enjoy being around someone who's nice to themselves, who's also nice to them as well. And so just self-love, self-compassion, it really leads to fulfilling attachments and fulfilling companionship and meaningful connections. Amen to that. <laughs> um, I, I love it. I think this has just been a rich conversation about really important things that we need to know when we're out there dating because we can become so fatigued and so pessimistic and um, there are psychological impacts to dating apps that we can work through. We don't have to let them control us or take us down and and make us not want to date. And I know that you also offer an, a program called the Love Lab. Um, so tell us about that. So, you know, not, not everybody wants to stay online. And, and I always recommend that they do a multi-pronged approach to dating and not just do one thing. So this is a, a wonderful alternative. So tell us a little bit about it. So we really pride ourselves in the spaces we've curated for people who are interested in finding love. So the Love Lab are our series of matchmaking events, and they consist primarily of three segments where we have first a masterclass where we give and help people apply uh, dating skills and communication skills and self-confidence building workshops, followed by our speed dating rounds. So the attendees beforehand, we give them a quiz, which helps us understand as psychologists how these people think, feel, and relate to both themselves and other people, which helps inform the speed dating rounds that we curate for our attendees. Then after the speed dating rounds have completed, we end with our mingling session. So perhaps somebody caught your eye and you weren't matched with them to speak with them. Well, in that space, you can use all of the skills that we helped you develop in the master class at the beginning and apply them out in the real world, out in the wild with people who have also like-mindedly attended this event and are looking for authentic companionship. Awesome. And Nazanin, do you want to add anything to that? Sure. One issue that we see in our clients was that this challenge of how do I know if the person is invested enough? Well, through our kind of process of examining when people applying for application, 
we choose people that are invested enough. So we do this screening for people. And I hear often from my clients, that's the best part for them. They say, you screen it so I don't need to waste my time going through all of these chats. And I hope we'll see uh, people here uh, and uh, on our next event, which will be in, around uh, Valentine. Oh, cool. And this is in Los Angeles right now. Yeah. Is this the only place you're offering it? For now, yes. And okay. But in our website, we have tons of different resources because honestly, we are in the business of helping people find love because the more love we have in life, the better people we can be. So if people are curious about getting our free videos, we have videos there, then we can check out our website as well. So can you give us that address? Sure, it's lalovelab.com. Okay, great. And um, I know that you have a podcast. Um, can you tell us a little bit about where people can find that? Absolutely. So uh, in addition to being a clinical psychologist, I'm a certified sex therapist. So wherever people listen to this podcast, they can search for my show. It's called Sexology Podcast. It releases every Tuesday and we just uh, release episode 400. So we talk about science of sex and pleasure in a way that's easy for people to listen. Awesome. And Richard, can you share where people can find you? Absolutely. So as a licensed clinical psychologist specializing in human sexuality and relationships, I can best be found on my website, which is www.drrichardespinosa.com for Dr. Richard Espinosa, or my Instagram, which is at epsychservicespc. Awesome. Well, thank you both for coming on the show and really injecting some optimism and some great tools and uh, helping people just to understand themselves better. And I think, you know, the more we can do that, the, the better, the better the world will be. So thank you again. Thank you, Sandy, for having us. This conversation was such a joy. And thank you for all, all that you're doing to bringing love and happiness to people's life. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Sandy, thank you so much for this conversation. It was great to just explore and just have a chat about how we help people just find their perfect matches. And thank you so much for sharing your platform with us and sharing this so that people can find their authentic self and share that with somebody else. And thanks everybody for listening. If you love our show, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, share the show with your friends, follow us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen, Spotify, everywhere. And as always, here's to your last first date. If you are ready to get unstuck, gain new tools, become more empowered, and finally find your last first date, I'd love to talk to you. Fill out an application to be considered for a complimentary half-hour love breakthrough session at lastfirstdate.com forward slash application. 